You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Pastor Kathleen Panning. Kathleen Panning, who has been an ordained minister for over 35 years, brings her experience to your ministry. Be it energizing your staff or working through conflicts with your faith community. So now, please welcome the host of A Flame Ministry, Pastor Kathleen Panning. Welcome. This is A Flame Ministry, and I am your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning. You are listening on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And to remind all of our listeners, this is a show about ministry for people of all faiths, people who are professionals in ministry, as well as those who are part of the ministry of a faith community. And there are always two goals to these shows. One is to uh, dispel misconceptions between various faiths and to try and build some bridges. And the second is to discuss issues of ministry that are common to all faiths. And today, my guest is going to kind of combine both of those, and uh, we're going to be talking about both of those things. Uh, And my guest today is uh, Naomi, excuse me, Rabbi Naomi Kalish, um, her Title is ACPE BCC, which is part of her accreditation. Uh, she is the coordinator of pastoral care and education at the New York Presbyterian Hospital and Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital, where she teaches clinical pastoral education to religiously diverse groups of students. She teaches spirituality in health at the Columbia University Medical Center, and she's the incoming vice chair of the Pediatric Ethics Committee. Naomi has taught chaplaincy programs and courses at Yeshivat Kochvefi Torah, uh, Yeshivat Maharat, and the Academy of Jewish Religion. And she's also past president of Neshama, uh, which is an association of Jewish chaplains. She is a doctoral candidate in education and Jewish studies at New York University and is writing a history of the Jewish entry into the field of chaplaincy education. Uh, Naomi is also an international fellow of KAICIID, which is the King Abdullah bin Abdul. Uh, Abdulaziz International Center of Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue. She is the chair of Sadaka Tzedaka Day, a national community service program of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, an organization that cultivates relationship and understanding between Muslim and Jewish women. She is a founding board member of the Hudson County Brotherhood Sisterhood Association and is the director of Hudson Interfaith Teen Initiative in Hudson County, New Jersey, one of the most diverse counties in the United States. And I'm exhausted almost with saying all of what you're involved with, uh, Naomi, and welcome to the show today. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be um, here. That is absolutely fantastic. I'm excited to have you. You work as a chaplain and as an educator of uh, clinical pastoral education, which is also known as CPE. Uh, Why did you choose to work in those areas? So thank you for asking that. My story goes back to rabbinical school. When I was studying to become a rabbi, I had actually never heard of a chaplain or 
a hospital chaplain, and we have a series of required internships, which I first of all always take that requirements can sometimes lead to discernment and revelation, and so just because something's required doesn't always mean that it's um, simply a box to be checked off. And as I did that internship, which involved going, leaving the seminary and going into hospitals and visiting with people and then coming back to class for reflection, um, I had a sense that I was doing what I always thought rabbis were meant to do, which was to be with people during times of crisis and to help them access whatever it is for them, religion, spirituality, culture, help them access what will be helpful to them as they navigate their way through the crisis that they're going through. So I had my own awakening experience during that. And after that, I pursued more training, um, my own training in clinical pastoral education. And then I worked for a couple years as a hospice chaplain, actually it was a palliative care chaplain, and um, I really felt a, a call toward teaching, and so that's what led me into the, the teaching com part of chaplaincy. Wonderful. Now, you also work at, more specifically, I guess, in, in pediatrics. And uh, how is providing spiritual care for children uh, a bit different than for adults? Yeah, so I've worked for the last nine years specifically in pediatrics, and the field of chaplaincy in general involves a synthesis between theology or religion and psychology. And the models I was trained in as a, chap as a chaplain very much draw on what we could call adult therapeutic methods, though... Um, though not doing the work as a therapist, which is an entire area, um, which is an area of distinction which chaplains and therapists and psychologists that we'll talk about um, in terms of addressing wellness and spirituality versus um, emotional dis distress or psychological mental illness. Um, but nonetheless, the methods are very talk-oriented in a way that's often very meaningful and effective for adults. But children often dwell, and of course it depends on the age, but dwell in the realms of play and imagination, and art, and in pediatrics, we've, um, pediatric chaplaincy, we've sought to integrate some of those methods into the spiritual care that we provide. So we'll be more likely to use storytelling or to use um, imagination play. Um, we developed a booklet for children to write in and draw in about spiritual themes like what they're hoping for or what they need strength for, what gives them strength, um, what helps them feel mm. grounded. Um, but we need to do that in a method, uh, with a method that will really work for them. Yeah, because a lot of the adult type conversations, the kids won't understand and won't know what we're talking about. Um, but yet children have a very deep spirituality in their own way in many cases, and it's really neat to be able to deal with that kind of in a language that they understand. Um, you work as a chaplain and teach uh, clinical pastoral education, or CPE, in New York City. And that's one of the most diverse cities, not only in this country, but around the world, I'm told. Uh, can you tell us about what you've learned about working with religiously uh, and culturally diverse groups with it, with the children, with adults, wherever that might be there. Yeah, so there's always a component in chaplaincy of just the, the common that people, that all people share, um, and then aspects of distinctiveness or difference. And um, actually something I didn't say earlier, but that really drew me to chaplaincy is the sense of um, the need to help people become more comfortable being present to other people while they're 
while they're in pain, uh, whether that's physical pain or emotional pain, or even we can talk about religious or spiritual pain, and that for clergy, and our, our CBE is an educational program that brings diverse groups of of clergy together, that it's important that we help them uh, feel like they have the well, strength and, and the courage have, to... We're going to have to leave it right there, and we'll come back and pick it up with that, because we have to take time for a commercial break. So this is um, BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact a symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. We are back, and this is Kathleen Panning, um, Pastor, your host for Aflame Ministry here on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And my guest today is Rabbi Naomi Kalish, and we're talking about um, chaplaincy in uh, in hospital settings uh, or many other kinds of chaplaincy uh, uh, and pediatrics and the diversity of working uh, in that. And before the break, Naomi, you were just getting into this idea of um, how chaplaincy works with religiously and culturally diverse groups. So please continue your conversation with that. Yes. So the field of chaplaincy in the United States is very much a field which embraces diversity. And so our model of training, as well as our model of ministry or service, involves working with diverse groups of people. And so um, I would say this exists in any encounter between any two people, even if they come from the same religious background, maybe gender, age, even if they have the same illness. There will always be components of difference because people have different emotional experiences and they have different personal stories, sequences of events, as well as the meaning that they make out of why they're experiencing what they're experiencing. But of course, in a city like mine, New York City, we also have some pretty uh, dramatic diversity in terms of all sorts of demographic uh, areas, which include nationality, language, culture, and religion. And so what I find is that diversity can be very exciting for some people, uh, myself included, um, but that it also can raise a lot of um, concerns or fears or worries about not wanting to overstep or make a mistake. And that's where I think that the training can really be very helpful, which is not only learning some cultural competency, but also learning how to not know everything and how to really defer to the person that one's 
in service of and to learn from them what would be meaningful, what would be helpful, what are their spiritual resources, what are their emotional supports, community supports. And I also believe that the hospital becomes a meeting ground for people who may never have contact with one another. And that can be incredibly Mm -hmm. profound to meet someone from a different faith background or a different um, ethnic background, nationality background, that sometimes it even happens that people who come from communities that are in conflict with one another will come together in a caring relationship. And that can be incredibly transformative in terms of attitudes towards one another. Is there any uh, experience that you can uh, share with us that would illustrate some of that? Yes, and I'll give two different kinds of examples. So one, I'll talk about diversity within one faith community, which is my community, the Jewish community, and then the other I'll talk about Mm -hmm. interfaith connections. So as with any faith group, Judaism has a variety of denominations, and sometimes as with any faith group, there can be politics or there can be tensions. And in fact, one of the questions I'm sometimes asked is, as a liberal rabbi, I was ordained by the conservative movement. Am I accepted by people from the Orthodox community, which for the most part does not ordain women? I say for the most part because over the last five years, one of the institutions you mentioned Yeshivat Maharat is an Orthodox institution that's now ordaining Orthodox women, but that's um, really very, very new. Um, And so what I always say in response is, accept me for what or as what. And if one presents themselves as an advocate for the other who's there to support them, um, then there really isn't a question or attention. And so it really becomes a wonderful opportunity within the Jewish community to be in support of one another and not actually be focused on the differences in any sort of debating way. Of course, those differences do factor in in terms of how we might care for one another. So I I can give an example, which is that um, traditionally in orthodoxy, women, married women will cover their hair, and then the liberal communities, generally women won't. You can hear I'm not making complete statements because, of course, there's different exceptions. And I remember Mm -hmm. once being called by a nurse asking, saying she didn't understand the patient was asking for a surgical cap, and she just didn't understand why the woman wanted the surgical cap. And I was able to realize that it was a woman who generally, for modesty purposes, covers her hair. And um, and that she had left her head covering at home. So it wasn't my practice, but I was helping translate culturally so that the woman could feel comfortable. Um, so that's an example from the Jewish community. In terms of interreligious support and collaboration, there's uh, so many different examples I could give. Um, for instance, New York City is a very uh, Christian as well as Catholic city, and so it's um, frequent that there will be requests for anointings or for um, daily communion or for baptism, and it becomes everybody's responsibility to ensure that the right person, so one of our priests or if it's uh, for Protestant, that one of our ministers is contacted for those and that we all share the burden of responsibility that if that's the pastoral need of the family, that they are able to meet with the appropriate person and um, receive the sacrament that they are per- that they are wanting. Um, and similarly, in New York City, we have a large, uh, like I was mentioning, Jewish community, and so we'll have a lot of people who are Sabbath observant. And so regardless of who's mm-hmm. working that day as the chaplain, if there's a request for something that would... Um, that would help the observance, such as Sabbath hospitality, the chaplain's required to make sure that that happens. And we're going to have to take another break right here. So um, this is the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio, and I am Pastor Kathleen Penning on Aflame Ministry. Please stay tuned. 
psychologist, master certified coach, and CEO of the executive and organizational development firm, True North Leadership, Dr. Relly Nadler brings his expertise in emotional intelligence to keynotes, consulting, coaching, and training. He is the author of Leader's Playbook and Leading with Emotional Intelligence that lays out tips and tools for effective leadership. Dr. Nadler has designed multi-day executive boot camps for high achievers in Fortune 500 companies and has coached CEOs, presidents, and their staff and developed and delivered innovative leadership programs for such organizations as Anheuser-Busch, BMW, MCI, EDS, DreamWorks Animation, the U.S. Navy, and Vanguard Health Systems. To learn more and get your free iPhone app highlighting his tools with videos, leadership keys, visit www.truenorthleadership.com today. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. We are back, and you are listening on TuneIn Radio and the BBM Global Network. I am Pastor Kathleen Panning, your host for A Flame Ministry. My guest today is Rabbi Naomi Kalish, and we're talking about chaplaincy and diversity, and um, it'll go in a few other directions here in a little while, I think. But um, before the break, uh, Naomi, you were talking about uh, experiences with some of the diversity in chaplaincy, and you have some things to share about um, an initiative for providing food uh, for Muslims during Ramadan. Please share that with our listeners. Yes, we have a wonderful initiative which was started a couple years ago by one of the nurses I work with. She founded an organization called Caregiver. It's actually a pun with the Arabic. It's spelled K-H-A-I-R-G-I-V-E-R. And um, so the Caregiver, and it involves uh, caring. And basically, she organizes um, donations, financial as well as um, uh, items to be um, given to the family members of Muslim patients at the children's hospital while their child is hospitalized. So, of course, for a, a patient, there's a lot of considerations in terms of their food. But what we find is, especially in pediatrics, patients, off, parents often don't want to leave the bedside, um, as well as we're an inter- we're a hospital that has many international patients, so we also have families who have traveled from abroad. And we've just begun the month of Ramadan, which involves fasting throughout the day, daytime hours, and the sun sets late this time of year. So it really provides an important religious service um, to provide food for the family members while they are in the hospital with their loved one. And it also communicates so much more. And so um, we partner that chaplaincy provides additional logistical support for this service, which, as I mentioned, is provided by a, an external nonprofit organization. But the feedback that we give is that people have said things like, we've traveled from thousands of miles away, yet we feel at home. And we're going to go back and tell people in our community and in our country, they shouldn't worry about traveling during this religious time of year because their religion will be respected and and accommodated and they will be cared for. So when I think about um, 
how important it is to provide for the religious and spiritual needs of people and families while they're going through illness and hospitalization, this really demonstrates that it can actually make a, a tremendous difference in terms of people feeling comfortable and not wondering if they need to delay their medical treatment because they have a conflict between their, their faith and the treatment that they're pursuing. That's so important and something that um, a lot of people might not even think about uh, is, you know, if that's not an issue for them as far as dietary needs uh, specific for any kind of religious holiday or religious time of the year. And um, that that's, I would assume that for, um, you know, people in the Jewish community like yourself, uh, during certain times that that would also be observed, like during Passover or uh, even um, on the Sabbath, that those kinds of dietary needs would be respected and honored. Yes, and I think because the hospital is obviously a scientifically based institution, sometimes people fear that they can't integrate their religion and spirituality, whether it's a concrete observance like we're talking about with Ramadan or with keeping kosher or mm -hmm. observing the Sabbath, but it can also be belief systems. And so it's it's come up, I've actually seen this come up from people from a wide variety of faith traditions where um, they want to respond to their situation with prayer or they have beliefs in mm. miracles and praying for miracles, which don't necessarily conflict with also receiving medical treatment, but they're not really sure how to express that within the, ho within the hospital context. And sometimes mm -hmm. hospital staff are not really sure how to respond when a patient or a family member says, I believe in miracles. They don't know exactly what that means and what that means in terms of their medical decision making. So in situations like that, chaplains can help be a bridge or be a translator. It, uh, yeah, and that, that's important. And because you are a hospital system that's large enough, uh, I'm you know, you have not only Christian chaplains, uh, but you all, I would assume there's a, a Muslim chaplain uh, or somebody available on call uh, for emergency situations like that as well. And, um, you know, in a larger community like New York City, you can provide that. With the smaller communities, um, that gets to be a little bit more of a challenge for uh, those in chaplaincy. But um, learning from someone like yourself, uh, the diversity training could be really important. Because um, when I went through CPE, that, that of course, that was quite a few years ago, uh, that wasn't even really talked about a lot. So that would be a, a wonderful gift that you can bring nowadays to that kind of training. Um, how, how do you make the connection with all of this between chaplaincy then and peace building? Yes. So I very much believe that the skills and the orientation of caregiving, spiritual and emotional caregiving that is emphasized in chaplaincy and in CPE have real significance in the realm of peace building. Um, and that often it's an area that is, um, that's not emphasized, but which I think people know intuitively. So I can give an example. I recently uh, saw a film which is called The Pastor and the Imam. And it's about mm -hmm. two faith leaders in Nigeria from obviously Christian and Muslim backgrounds who are coming together to promote peace. And they'll even do things like walk through town together because the image of the two of them walking through town, talking like friends, creates um, an image which is challenging to some of the assumptions in the conflict that their country is going through. But one part of the film stood out to me that was not necessarily emphasized, which is one of them went to the hospital because his mother was ill and he needed to help her get uh, medical care. And the other one heard of this and debated, should I visit? Should I not visit? And he decided, let me go to the hospital and visit her. 
And in the documentary, the other one describes how meaningful that was, that the other one came to be with them, and it touched him. And I think what it does is it touches something deeper than our face identities, which is our experience as human beings, that we know that all of us experience illness, we experience death, we experience bereavement, and to be there is incredibly profound, to be there with one another. And uh, we'll come back and talk more about that. We have to take another break. This is A Flame Ministry on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. We'll be right back. Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe to Chandra Poulard, owner and CEO of House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran-owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C., Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various businesses business interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. And we are back on TuneIn Radio and the BBM Global Network. This is A Flame Ministry, and I am Pastor Kathleen Panning. My guest today is um, Rabbi Naomi Kalish, and we're talking about chaplaincy and diversity and um, peace building. And before the break, Naomi, you were talking about the, the movie that you saw called The Pastor and the Imam, and uh, how important it was for people uh, from uh, th- that pastor and the imam to be together and be supportive of one another. And you're also active in an organization called the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. Um, what is this organization and how does that relate to all of this? Yes, well, this is a wonderful organization which was founded in 2010 by a woman named Cheryl Olitsky and another woman named Atia Aftab. And it's a grassroots organization which has a very basic mission of bringing Jewish and Muslim women into relationship with one another and helping them deepen their understanding of one another and strengthen community. With that also comes the goal of through this unity being a source for advocating um, for peace and for understanding and also countering what we see in our broader society, the rise in Islamophobia and a rise in anti-Semitism. So it's an organization which mostly functions on a local level with small chapters of, of membership between 10 and 20. And then there's also regional planning or organizing and training as well as an annual conference, um, and also a few other national initiatives. But in some ways, it's like what I was saying in the hospital, where in the hospital, we have this opportunity to meet people from backgrounds we may never have met. 
in many pockets of American life, Jewish and Muslim women don't necessarily cross paths. And so this is a concerted effort to bring women together from the Jewish and Muslim backgrounds into conversation. And the reason why it focuses on Jew the Jewish and Muslim communities are for a few reasons. One is because both of these communities are minority religions within the United States. A second is there are a good number of areas of commonality, and in, in many cases, unknown commonality between the faith traditions. Um, and a third is because due to political situations, often the Muslim and Jewish communities are in conflict and in some ways unnecessarily in conflict, which doesn't mean that people can should not have differences of opinions around political issues. And there's obviously plenty of diversity also within the Muslim and Jewish communities, but this becomes an opportunity to um, find areas where we can really support one another and advocate together for what we share in our values and and our experiences. Can you share what some of those um, unknown, kind of surprising commonalities might be? Well, one of the national initiatives, which I actually serve as the chair for, is this program called Sadaqat Sadaka Day. It took me a while to learn how to correctly pronounce both of those. It's the Hebrew and the Arabic words, basically for charity or for service. They get translated slightly differently. And so it's basically a national day of community service. But here we see that the same core values exist within both traditions. Of course, the values of service and community service exist probably in every faith tradition and world tradition. Um, but we also see that the words and the, the Hebrew and Arabic words share roots. And so usually this day, we, we schedule it on Christmas Day to be a day of mm. contribution also to American society, as most of America is celebrating Christmas. So we'll volunteer at soup kitchens, or we'll collect hygiene packets, or uh, we'll bake cookies and deliver it to the police and the fire and the hospital workers. So each chapter decides something different that comes organically out of the interests of the women in that chapter and their local community. Um, but other areas of similarity are things like having regular prayer um, for Jews, uh, daily, uh, three times daily prayer, and for Muslims, five times, having dietary laws uh, for halal and kosher, um, and then, of course, the language similarities. Um, I'd say also not a shared scripture, but many of the same sacred stories, and so that becomes a, a really rich and vibrant area of conversation for how some of those stories are told similarly and differently within the two traditions. Hmm, yeah. I, I, a previous show here had a woman on who is Muslim and talked about um, the three major religions are all people of the book. And yes, they're their commonality in, in all of that. Um, and sometimes we forget that. Uh, when we, when the differences are highlighted and focused on, so um, you said there are, there are local and regional and, and national chapters. Are are there? Is this international as well? So there is a presence, a chapter in Canada, at least one, and there mm -hmm. is also collaboration with similar groups. Uh, one specifically in the United Kingdom. I'm not sure if there are other chapters beyond Canada, um, but I do know that the organization, the organization has grown tremendously over the last year and a half. Um, it was about 20 to 30 chapters about a year and a half ago, and now it's, I believe, about 150 chapters. Mm, wow. That's fantastic. Um, wonderful to see. And and uh, I know that I can't remember who, which leader, leader it was, if it was Desmond Tutu or someone of that caliber said that if the world is going to be saved, it's going to be by Western women. And this is one way that um, that kind of bridging and understanding uh, is at least being started. And 
I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, You've just been back, I understand, from a trip to Indonesia uh, for for a program of interreligious dialogue. And we're going to talk about that when we get back. So we have to take another break for some commercials. Um, This is a Flame Ministry on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. We'll be right back. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Stapula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis drives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomenon while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands Thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305 705 3428 or email her at Renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru. Way. We are back, and this is a Flame Ministry on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm Pastor Kathleen Panning, your host for a Flame Ministry, and today we're talking uh, uh, about chaplaincy and uh, diversity and uh, peace building. Um, and my guest is Rabbi Naomi Kalish. And before the break, I'm just starting to mention that you recently back from a trip to Indonesia for a program in interreligious dialogue training. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, thank you. This year, I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to be a fellow with the organization Seed, which you were introduced at the beginning of the program. And this organization is intergovernmental, which means it's like the UN in that it was established by different governments, but it's on a much smaller scale. And it specifically, unlike the UN, puts religion at the center for purposes of promoting conflict resolution and peace building. And so on an educational level throughout this year, I meet with a cohort three times a year um, of 20 people from 15 different countries, and we wow. learn different techniques of interfaith dialogue. We learn theories of conflict resolution, and we learn about the intersection. And so one of the greatest insights I've gained from this training is that much of world conflict is not actually religious at its core. However, religion is often manipulated and co-opted to bolster different positions in conflict. So part of what we're learning is first how to disentangle that, and then second, how to use religion for promoting peace. And so when I think about that on a more specific level, how to humanize the other, how to um, promote the value of peace and tolerance and diversity and inclusion. So we had a meeting earlier in the year when we did part one, and I've just come back a few days ago from Indonesia in which we continued that learning as well as we learned from the local community in Indonesia about their situation and their initiatives for peace building. 
And it was fascinating because Indonesia is a very different country in some ways from the United States. I learned that they don't consider themselves a religious country, though they do have six officially recognized religions by the government. Um, they are also a Muslim majority country, and they actually have the largest Muslim community of any country in the world. Um, but they do also have diversity, uh, religious diversity beyond that. And so some highlights from that trip included meeting with a woman named Alyssa Wahid, who's the national director of a family foundation named after her father, who is the a former and a late president, Abdul Rahman Wahid. And he was the first democratically elected president of Indonesia and used his presidency to promote diversity and inclusion. The motto of Indonesia is diversity in unity. And we learned about the initiatives that they're taking to become mm -hmm. even more inclusive of the groups who don't fall within those six. And so I asked a question, which was, um, how do they engage children in this, especially given that the country is very geographically divided between those faith groups? So there'll be you know, an entire section that's Muslim, and then there'll be like a certain area that's Hindu and other sections which are Protestant, others that are Catholic. So how do they actually promote interreligious dialogue, given that they don't have the opportunity to have those meeting grounds, kind of like what I was talking about earlier in the hospital and the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, mm -hmm. when you can actually meet someone. So the answer I got, I thought was actually very intuitive and seemed so right to me, which is that even when teaching within one's own faith tradition, one should be teaching about about encounters with the other and about peaceful encounters with the other and respect for the other. And that's something we all can be doing. Even I can be doing that in the New York City area, even when I'm not interacting with other people, when I'm at my synagogue or within a Jewish space, I can be highlighting those stories and using that language. It, that's so interesting. It reminds me that not too long ago I saw something from another chaplain uh, where virtually all religions have the same basic core value of uh, what is often called the golden rule, uh, you know, yeah. how you treat other people, treat them like you want to be treated. And, um, you know, this whole idea of teaching that uh, and we've kind of lost track of a lot of that, at least in this country. So um, is there anything else that came out of that experience uh, for you in Indonesia that um, kind of stood out for you? Well, another initiative I learned about was specifically organizations and programs for women in interreligious dialogue. And I thought that was very interesting and also important that what we were hearing from them was the importance of creating a space, a women's space. And it's also something I think about with the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, that sometimes that comes out of um, working with communities that have more gender distinction or gender role distinction. And so wanting to honor that and um, and so that's one reason. Um, but also, I think that even when there's not gender distinction on the books, so to speak, like one's working and living within a, a gender equal um, or a context that has gender equality, there's often still a lot of struggles of working in historically patriarchal systems. And so it mm -hmm. becomes a way of advocating also from a women's perspective. And so I thought that was that was very inspirational for me to think about that, that even though I experienced the United States and I experienced my religious denomination as having gender equality, there's still a lot of work to be done. And I'd say the third reason is that um, they didn't use the language of feminism, but I would say also um, for men or women that a space that is um, inspired by feminist thinking, um, meaning the uncovering of women's stories and of silent voices um, as something that's beneficial as well as, as well as other areas of feminist theory, can also be incredibly beneficial. So that was another piece that was meaningful to me about, about 
being in Indonesia. On a, I would say on a more that, that, somber note, um, during our visit there, there were a series of terrorist attacks. Um, one was at a church, so a religious minority, and two were against the police. And even before those took place, they were not near our program, but they most definitely affected everybody's feelings as well as, and obviously mostly the, you know, the people who live in Indonesia and work in Indonesia. And I was also incredibly moved by the courage of the people that we met with, given the realities of opposition. And that's important. And we could probably spend a whole hour on that. We have to take another break. This is BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio and a Flame Ministry. We'll be right back. The earliest human societies worshipped a female goddess. Little is known about this time because we did not always have a written recorded history. It was around 3100 BC when the Sumerians invented the first written language, and everything that preceded this time is prehistory. The prehistorical record includes all of women's unwritten history from 30,000 B.C. to the time that men began achieving political power around 3,000 B.C. Male feminist artist Kimberly Berg maintains a strong position in educating and inspiring both men and women through his devotional art to the goddess in all women. Studying their history is paramount to understanding who women were and who they would become later living in a patriarchal society. To learn more about this important time in our history, go to www.isisrising.net. Do you ever wonder why certain things are happening in your life? How to start a business or a new direction? Need answers? Astrologer Bonnie Perbula can help you reveal your true self and gain strength and focus so you can achieve greater joy and success. Working with a natal birth date, time, and location, Bonnie brings out qualities to aid you in getting the best from your life. She can help you unlock dormant traits to bring you greater awareness. Bonnie also conducts public speaking engagements to educate aspiring astrologers on their journey to the stars. A gifted artist, Bonnie bridges her talents and recently launched a line of Astro Bears, uniquely created in colors of individuals' astrology charts. She also makes one-of-a-kind necklaces of crystal beads and woven thread. To learn more about the world of Bonnie Prabula, go to BonnieGPrabula.com. And for astrology consulting, visit AstrologyConsultants.com or call or email her at 808-526-1536 or BonnieGP at AOL.com. Welcome back. This is a Flame Ministry on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning. My guest today is um, Rabbi Naomi Kalish. And Naomi, we've been talking about so many things with chaplaincy and uh, diversity and peace building. What are a couple of the really important gems that you would like to leave with people today? First, I'd like to highlight the value of caring for the other and that caring, tending to the human and the affective experience of others is not the totality of how we change the world or how we improve the world, but it provides such an important foundation. So as we also value intellectual discourse and policy making and activism, I really encourage people to also make sure to be valuing caring and also recognizing that it's not easy and it's hard and that there's many different ways to develop the capacity to care for others. So one would be taking a class in clinical pastoral education as well as many other ways um, to develop that in oneself. And the second takeaway I'd like to leave people with is to stay focused on this point I was making towards the end of of our time just a few minutes ago about amplifying the narratives and the language of peace and for peace from within our own religious and cultural contexts, that that's such an important place that we start locally, even when we're thinking globally about peace, and that we really begin within ourselves and within our communities to use the language and stories of peace and be teaching those stories to people um, from a young age and upward. 
those are wonderful points, and I think that's just a a beautiful idea that uh, showing other people our love and our caring uh, in our actions, as well as our words, and as well as our policies, are really, really important things to do. And and um, to share those stories of peace, which they're there for all of us. Uh, it's just a matter of remembering them and highlighting them and making sure we pass them on, pass them on to other people. I thank you so much, Naomi, for being here today. It has been absolutely wonderful to have you as a guest. Um, there may be people who want to get in touch with you and learn more about some of these organizations, and uh, they can do that with your uh, email address at um, the New York Presbyterian Hospital, and that is nak9035 at nyp.org so for people who may want to learn more about um, uh, this uh, Salom Shalom uh, Salam Shalom and any of the other things that you've talked about again it's nak9035 at nyp.org and for those who want to get in touch with me have other ideas for future programs, um, please go to my website, which is aflameministryconsulting.com, uh, or you can find me on Facebook at the same uh, name, Aflame Ministry Consulting on Facebook. And I'd love to hear comments and feedback from people about the program and um, see where we can go and continue this dialogue, this conversation about learning from one another and base peace building and um, finding new ways to care with one another and for one another as well. So Naomi, again, it is an honor and a privilege to have you here today. And I really thank you for being here. Um, Please come back next week for all you listeners and we'll have another show uh, here on Aflame Ministry on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And until then, Peace to each and every one of you. This has been a Flame Ministry with your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning. Tune in each week as Kathleen guides you through the many challenges that face our faith based communities today as she ignites the ministry of your faith community so that more people can hear the message of God's love on Kathleen Panning's A Flame Ministry. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.